Good morning. I am Dr. Vanda Foba Brown, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and uh, the director of the Initiative of Non-State Armed Actors and the Africa Security Initiative. And I'm delighted that you can join us today for a conversation to explore the strengths and challenges of UN state building mission over the past 20 years, the opportunities and way forward as we are uh, entering a new era of both geopolitics and UN state building mission potentially. The post 9-11 era featured not just a globalized effort against non-state armed actors, particularly jihadi ones, but also extensive and frequent UN state building missions that were a part of or sometimes took alongside or on the heels of international interventions, often international military interventions, some of which were not under the sponsorship of the United Nations. The missions, the UN missions often became the source of superior information about local actors and violence patterns. Uh, they became uh, crucial mediating, negotiating and state building actors. The UN mission in Afghanistan is such an example. We are meeting today close to the one year mark since the Taliban took over Afghanistan. The UNAMA mission there over many years, um, including over the past years at the time led by Ambassador de Blatt Lyons, who was the special representative of the Secretary General until very recently, did a heroic job in that context. Sometimes, because UN state building missions um, were started uh, precisely because their unique uh, strengths and capabilities were recognized. Other times, they were initiated because the principal planetary interveners did not want to be saddled with those state building and political responsibilities. The reality now is that despite massive international resources deployed to places such as South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, uh, the Central African Republic, Libya and Somalia, many of those missions are continuing to face significant challenges and showed only limited uh, improvements towards stable, inclusive and accountable governance led by local actors. And so it is now 20 years since those uh, missions uh, were, uh, many of those missions were uh, initiated. Uh, a good time to think about what has worked well and what hasn't, so what hasn't worked so well. And we have an absolutely um, uh, star uh, panel uh, to do so. I would, uh, on my side, suggest that one of the key challenges for the UN missions um, that has been the same challenge that it has been for other actors, such as the United States, other governments trying to conduct state building. Often uh, the local partners have had very different agendas than the state building UN missions. Uh, and sometimes they've proven to be venal, predatory, corrupt, parochial and exclusionary. Um, one of the reasons why the Taliban was able to take over uh, Afghanistan. And so often that has been a big disalignment, not alignment between uh, the uh, international UN and other state building efforts and those of local partners. And another challenge of course now is that we are uh, at the end of the uh, post Cold War era. We are in the era of new geopolitics of great power competition or global power competition. Uh, but we are also uh, at the end of the post 9-11 era that was characterized by this universal opposition or at least universal desire to neutralize non-state armed actors, even if there were disagreements. In fact, we are back to the Cold War dynamics of my terrorists being seen as the opponent's uh, freedom fighter. Yet another uh, difficult challenge uh, for UN uh, peacekeeping missions and uh, state building missions, as well as for other state building efforts. So we have a star team uh, to have the conversation about what has worked well, what hasn't, what needs to adapt. Let me start with uh, Adam Day, who is the head of the Geneva office of the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. There, Adam oversees uh, efforts, uh, programming, uh, on peace building, human rights, peacekeeping, climate security issues, sanctions, uh, and global governance. And he also co-leads uh, the institution's high-level advisory uh, board on effective multilateralism. Prior uh, uh, to this very significant position, Adam uh, had a decade in the UN deployed in missions such as 
MONUSCO in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, um, in the UN Special Coordinator Office for Lebanon, uh, also uh, deployments to Khartoum, to Darfur, and was a political advisor in both the Department of Political Affairs and the Department of Peacekeeping Operations uh, at the UN in New York. Uh, prior to his stellar UN career, uh, Adam was the international litigator uh, in New York uh, at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where he worked on behalf of Guantanamo uh, detainees uh, and where he worked against uh, the use of uh, torture. Thank you very much for that service. Adam. He has published widely, and I want to mention uh, a terrific read. Adam has a new book, States of Disorders, Ecosystems of Governance. If you haven't yet read it, um, rush to it. Uh, uh, you will learn a lot. Adam, let me uh, start with you. What, in your view, are some of the key lessons uh, of the past 20 years for the UN? Thanks so much, Vanda. That was a great introduction. I was trying to take notes while listening at the same time. Um, and what a brilliant group to be joined by, a really um, amazing group. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. Really, I, I want to respond to that question uh, based on some of those experiences I had in UN peacekeeping, in living and working in some of those areas where the UN and, and the US and others were engaged in state building and stabilization. And then after I left the UN peacekeeping a few years ago, several years ago now, um, I conducted quite a few years of research specifically on DRC in, in South Sudan, um, um, which is the basis for that for that book. And what I hope to offer today is a starting point that is slightly different and hopefully transformative in understanding how state building works and, and doesn't work in those contexts to try and respond to that question. And, and for me, the, the key starting question really is why did those dynamics that you just described take place? Why after 20 years of international state building and billions of dollars of funding has it failed so often and so comprehensively against its own measures? Because really by failure, what I mean is it hasn't delivered the outcomes it lists in its own goals, mandates, and programs. And, and an example of that is, is the Democratic Republic of the Congo where the UN's had a mission there for, for over 20 years. And over that time has had an increasingly ambitious stabilization, state building, peace building mandate. And the goal of that mandate has largely been to reduce the impact of non-state armed groups in Eastern Congo, clear areas of insecurity and build up state capacities for governance in Eastern Congo. And if that kind of shape, clear, hold, build uh, language sounds familiar to you, that's the standard counterinsurgency terminology you see in US forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the idea behind that is really this understanding of ungoverned spaces, this, this sense that there are places without state governance capacities, without police stations or courthouses, without the basic delivery of services by the state. And these are considered and, and openly called ungoverned in traditional state building doctrine. Um, the former head of the mission in, in Monusco um, described the situation as a sea of instability and trying to build islands of stability in it that would be kind of state run islands of stability. But what's happened over the past 20 years in Congo, yes, there certainly have been some improvements in some really important areas, and we could talk about those. But that idea of extending state authority and reducing the, the area of influence and the impact of armed groups, I mean, look back in 2002, the UN counted around a dozen armed groups. By 2015, it was around 70 that the UN was counting. And by around 2020 or 2021, there was over 100 that were counted and very little measurable increase in the ability of state-led governance institutions in the East to counteract that or replace that, to use the kind of state building terminology. And this is despite billions being spent every year. So by its own goal of neutralizing armed groups and stabilizing the East through the extension of state authority, there isn't much of a success in a place like Eastern Congo. And this isn't an isolated phenomenon. I was in South Sudan in 2011 during the party to celebrate the, the country's secession and creation of a new country. The World Bank called that a moment to do state building, quote, from scratch, thinking of South Sudan as kind of a tabula rasa, which is what Salva Kiir called it at the time. And the UN had a plan to extend state authority into all of those ungoverned spaces of South Sudan. Every time I say ungoverned, please put quotes around it. And I, I actually led the um, part of the conflict assessment that led to that new mission in South Sudan. And we identified um, state governance capacities as, as, as one of the shortfalls that was most in need of, of work. So I was part of the problematic starting point there. And between 2011 and 2013, state building not only failed to develop 
meaningful state capacities in most places. I interviewed hundreds of South Sudanese people, um, a huge number of whom saw the UN operation as actually making things worse in some ways, feeding a dangerous dynamic by supporting the, the so-called Dinka dominated government at the time. And when civil war broke out only two years later, it was a clear indication that state building hadn't achieved its objectives. Similarly, when I worked on the UN mission in, in, in Libya, helping to set that up in 2012, same mandate, extension of state authority, stabilization, same idea of addressing the risks posed by warlords, and today, a quite similar result in some respects in terms of the inability to extend state authority into those areas. You look at Mali, Somalia, Afghanistan, the building's biggest state building efforts worldwide, and they all seem to be suffering from a series of deeply entrenched uh, problems in terms of achieving their mandates. So what's the problem? And, and one of the problems, I think, is actually a conceptual one. And we still tend to think of failed and fragile states as broken machines. And if you, I mean, Ashraf Ghani and Claire Lockhart's famous book, Fixing Failed States, captures that idea. But the concept really is that a machine has a broken piece. It has a part that's malfunctioning. So, for example, North Kivu has the Allied Democratic Forces armed group that needs to be taken out. Or there's a, ra a round of intercommunal violence in Jungle State that needs to be fixed. And the solution is to remove that or fix that broken piece and replace it with a working one, uh, a state institution, a, a courthouse or a police station or something. And this might work if you blow a gasket on your car, but my research approaches governance in a more systemic way. And societies are more like living organisms. They're complex ecosystems that can't be fixed by removing a single piece. And change happens in nonlinear ways in those systems. Um, there's a reason I have a beehive on the cover of my book. It's an example of, of a complex system. And I think that point about nonlinear changes is really important. If you look at a UN planning document, the input in some of them is something like police training. The output is trained police and, and placement of those police in the, in the field. And the outcome is improved stability. And, and one of the kind of transformative moments in, in my own kind of path through this is Rachel Kleinfeld's great article about planning for sailboats and not train tracks. Change doesn't happen in those linear ways. Change happens in complex systems in nonlinear ways. Inputs don't equal outputs. And I think what's more important and in looking at the, the, the specificity of those uh, settings are the patterns and underlying rules that allow a system to self-organize. So for example, in the, in the DRC, there is a system um, kind of in, within the police force called the Pakatui or umbrella system, which starts at the highest level and each person down the chain is protected in their position as long as they feed resources back up the chain. And so from the Ministry of Defense down to the individual police officer, an exchange of money for protection happens. And at the local level, this turns into predatory and corrupt networks and armed groups and private actors tend to feed off the population in that context. It links armed groups to the marketing of artisanal minerals on the international market and all the way out to the iPhone that's in everyone's pocket right now. But it's that network of relationships and that, that set of rules that kind of exist under the surface that I try and explore in my research and that I think is actually the modality for change to happen in those systems. And, and that is the governance system in a place like Eastern Congo or, or South Sudan. The system may appear different in different places and, and, and have different manifestations, but you can map those networks and see the relations at play. And that's what, that's what I try to do. So then what happens when the UN arrives with a Security Council mandate that says do SSR and the mission says, OK, we're going to reform your security sector. We're going to neutralize armed groups with force. We're going to pour a bunch of money into new state run governance capacities in eastern Congo. And what my, my research indicates is that the system doesn't respond in an input output way. In many cases, the attempt to neutralize armed groups actually increases the need for violence and non-state actors in some of those areas. Sometimes the exact opposite outcome happens. And so what tends to happen is uh, what we call lack of political will or corruption or, or underfunding never really um, results in the outcome is that you never really get to where you want to get, which is a stable state run governance system. And so in South Sudan, for example, multi billion dollar efforts to improve the governance capacities in the South Sudanese police force, judiciary, and, and local governors seem to kind of dissolve into endlessly deferred plans and never actually result in increases in legitimate state capacity over the, that two year period. So if you look at traditional UN explanations for this, they tend to have three or four. The first one they say is we didn't have enough money. You know, if only we had more resources to put into the system, we could have changed it better. The second one, and I think you can see what my thinking is on that. The second one is lack of political will or corruption. If the leaders weren't so vested in their venal ways of governance, we could have solved this problem. 
The third way is we were too top down. If we'd only really understood the hyper local experiences of conflict, we could have solved it from the bottom up. And there's a kind of fourth one, which is uh, if the UN wasn't so incompetent, we could have done it better. But that tends to be your basket of explanations. And I think my approach suggests a different focus. The first one is you focus on the underlying rules and patterns, what complexity theorists call strong attractors and say, how does the system work and what relationships are necessary to it? And how is the UN able or not able to affect those relationships? Um, and, this, and so, for example, the relationship amongst politicians, the SPLA in South Sudan, traditional leaders and communities generate a set. And how does the UN affect that by entering into it? And the second question really is, how have those systems changed over time? How do they deal with shocks? So, for example, how did South Sudan's governance system deal with the shock of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in the early 2000s? And how did that make the system evolve in different ways? And what can we learn from that about how it might evolve in the future? And I think it shows also, if you start looking at these very different systems, how very different settings like Libya, Afghanistan, South Sudan, DRC, and Somalia might all end up with a similar set of frustrations when the UN and, and other major actors tend to do state building in similar ways. Now, this doesn't let the individual leaders off the hook. And I hope in the second session, we can get into some of the kind of policy implications. But certainly, there are still corrupt people. There's still lack of resources. There's still over, overly top-down approaches that fail to account for local dynamics. But I think a systems approach as a starting point for state building allows us to begin to understand how change happens and how it doesn't happen and how it tends to frustrate many of the anticipated changes we have in those settings. And so really what I tried to do and what I continue to try and do is reflect what I heard in the hundreds of interviews I did in, in DRC and South Sudan, because the people there certainly understand how their systems work. They understand how interconnected it is. They understand that what we think of as cattle rustling in the periphery of South Sudan is intimately connected to power brokers in Juba, and that these relationships and networks are what produce their system. And so my attempt really is, is to relay that experience of, of the people that exist in these networks into the language of the state builder to try and change um, the way we think about a state building. And so hopefully in the second round, I can get into what does this actually mean for how we do things differently. But I wanted to start with that as kind of an opening explanation for why I think state building hasn't had the results that we that the West in general has has hoped to achieve. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so what you are really describing, Adam, uh, is um, uh, our systems of misgovernance. Now, that's not quite the right terminology either, because they are systems of governance that is deeply entrenched and deeply functional, even if not producing uh, peace. Uh, the, it produces a systems of, of conflict and exclusion but does so in a way that uh, uh, allows the systems to perpetuate themselves effectively, even despite the efforts and intervention of external actors. And how we uh, change that really has been the Gordian uh, nod for the international community. You know, you mentioned in your uh, remarks the um, uh, cleared hold built um, uh, elements of the um, international US Western counterinsurgency approach. And um, what we have seen and continue to see today in places like Mozambique, like Mali, like Nigeria, is that maybe, maybe we do some partial clearing. Uh, we do some uh, often very um, inadequate holding and the building uh, just about never takes place or at least not in the way that we have uh, intended it to take place. Well, I couldn't think of uh, a better person to um, offer now her reflections and follow Adam than uh, Ms. A. Heather Coyne, who is um, a longtime uh, UN insider like you, Adam, has been part of many of these missions. Uh, Ms. Coyne currently leads the security sector reform team uh, for the UN Special Envoy um, for Yemen. Prior to that, she served in UN missions um, in Somalia, also working on SSR, building capacity of the security agencies to oversee uh, armed forces, manage weapons, and regulate uh, the non-state armed actors, those aligned with the government. Um, prior to that, she also uh, served in Afghanistan as the acting senior police advisor for the UN mission, trying heroically uh, to uh, empower uh, civil society to make uh, the police forces of Afghanistan more accountable to citizens and more focused on the policing uh, that they wanted and uh, badly needed. 
prior to her uh, glamorous UN career, uh, uh, Ms. Cohen uh, was uh, uh, working at the, UN, at the US uh, Institute of Peace as the senior program officer for conflict uh, resolution and mediation and as USIP chief of party uh, in Iraq. And she also uh, served two years uh, of, she had two year military tour with NATO training missions uh, in Afghanistan. Um, hey Heather, I am so thrilled uh, that uh, we are able to have you on this call. Uh, please give us your take on what has worked well and what have been the challenges um, for the UN missions as you have uh, experienced them and broadly. Great. Well, Funda, my experience in the UN state building is uh, it's basically a dumbed down version of what Adam's complexity theory talks about if it's not an oxymoron to simplify complexity theory. Um, I say the UN, but the, the approaches I've seen across the international community, the US military, you call the African Union, all tend to follow the same playbook. I remember one of my first meetings with the Afghan civil society uh, when I had just joined NATO's training mission, which was really the, sort of the usual train and equip, clear, hold, build approach for the army and police. The civil society organizations told me, all you're doing is training better predators. The state building efforts by the international community, especially the UN's approach to security sector reform, often fall into the same trap. They focus on the state, namely the central government ministries, trying to build capacity for participatory and inclusive security governance, which is almost completely antith antithetical to the interests of the people in power, who naturally then work to undermine or slow the programming. Again and again, I saw efforts that were based on the assumption that security ministries would just give up their extractive practices with the UN working valiantly to, to uh, convince them it was for their own good. We, it's a classic example of uh, pushing on a string instead of pulling on it. Our arguments were just not very compelling against the very clear benefits that the leaders and all the people who work under them could gain from conducting business as usual. But I have seen initiatives that do work. They're few and far between, and they never really build enough momentum to change the direction of the state building intervention overall, as I saw to my own shame in Afghanistan. But all the things that work better have characteristics that revolve around one line from Adam's book. He said, what kind of interventions will allow societies to transform themselves from within? And let me give some examples of what that might look like. First, we have to work with actors who can drive change. That means actors who have power to make change and who have a direct interest in seeing that change happen. I, I had been working on community policing in Afghanistan and one activist told me, the human rights NGOs, the women's NGOs, they're good, but they're aspirational. They don't resonate with most of Afghan society. And when I asked who did, they said the taxi union, the bakers association and the sports federation. So that's where we started. Uh, the sports federation leader was absolutely thrilled about how he could use sports to make police more responsive to the people. And I said, do you mean the police will play against the community? And he said, no, the police are in such bad shape, they will always lose and that will cause more tension. So no, they will, the youth and the police will, will form joint teams and train together on the same team. Second, a, a related point, uh, the interventions that work best on, on, are, are ones that involve existing relationships and institutions that are relevant. And often, as Adam mentioned, those are actors or systems that are outside the scope of traditional state building. If we have time, I'll tell you about the money changers of Kabul uh, with their union was the most effective effort in community policing that I've ever seen. But, but let me talk a little bit about Yemen as well. When I first arrived here, I was told that the plan for the peace agreement was to create a new national committee of neutrals who would manage all the military and security issues in a transitional period. That's exactly the opposite of Adam's focus on existing relevant institutions. Not only was it overly fixated on the central government, but the plan was to sideline even the existing ministries in favor of a new clean slate that would somehow manage all the security forces without any basis in Yemeni law, any buy-in from the society, any relationships with power brokers, and not even any chairs. Do you, do you know how long it takes the UN to buy chairs? It's, it's really a very long time. 
So instead, our team looked for existing institutions, especially at the local level, who could take on the functions of implementing a ceasefire or peace agreement, and what we could do to help them do that. And what Yemenis told us was needed was to strengthen access for tribal mediators, local peace builders, and some municipal authorities to shape the implementation of a ceasefire, rather than investing all the power in a central authority. Those local organizations tend to focus on practical needs of communities and the fighters in the frontline areas. So exchanging prisoners and corpses, negotiating access to water infrastructure and electricity are caught out by the fighting, or addressing delivery of emergency services through armed groups in places civilian agencies can't reach. A third uh, principle in Adam's book refers to making relationships less violent without trying to dramatically change or replace them. That's especially relevant in the security sector where armed forces are often the biggest threat to the people. So instead of train and equip, we're working under an accountability first approach which builds on the relationships between security actors and communities that allow people to advocate for their own priorities and to use the leverage that they have to press for improved behavior of the security forces more effectively. A lot of that is offering opportunities for security forces uh, to interact with the population in safe, non-extort you at the checkpoint environments like that sports program or helping the police deliver basic safety briefings to schools um, knowledge that actually helps citizens deal with challenges on a daily basis. And a final entry point, just to mention here, is uh, dialogues between communities and security actors so that communities can advocate for their own needs, like moving a checkpoint so the citizens can reach their workplaces or not storing weapons in schools, as well as helping security actors then respond to those demands. But let me stop here and then maybe we can come back to this in the recommendation section to figure out what that means for trying to reform UN state building. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, you put on a, a lot of other additional thoughts, uh, some that I would just highlight. Um, you, although you never used the term, you raised really the issues of militias, which uh, have, of course, um, been a key feature of uh, anti-terrorism counterinsurgency effort for many decades, including after uh, the 9-11 and the, the, the past 20 years. Uh, where often the issue of accountability in arming them, supporting them, uh, has been um, very marginal, uh, and not marginal in the economic sense of making a change, but marginal as in um, uh, very underemphasized and uh, generated problems uh, in many ways, whether in their weakness uh, or in the consequences uh, the malicious actors um, generated. And this is, of course, all the more complicated now but, uh, that we, uh, we are returning to an era of many private security companies, um, even less accountable, like the Wagner Group. Of course, the Russian Wagner Group is not the only uh, uh, pri private security company the US has had. It's very many problems with companies like Blackwater and Z, but um, a very much uh, uh, a very significant factor uh, today. The other point that I just want to put on the table uh, as we all think and then move to the further conversation is, uh, the, you know, the prescription um, often is emphasize more civil society or focus on the actors who, who make change. And I love the money changers of Kabul uh, example of being really creative. Uh, nonetheless, um, both UN missions and certainly uh, individual government missions are structured to deal with governments. The business of foreign policy is to deal with governments. And so this raises the question of, do we really need to rethink um, um, foreign policies? But of course the governments uh, will be objecting. They don't want to hear, no money will not go to us, it will go to these um, um, actors of change, whether they are civil society or they are uh, other actors. And so when the civil society actors become effective, they can themselves become targets of neutralization. I can think of many settings where when the local initiative, the actors of change really start making a difference, they are undercut and eviscerated by our presumed governmental allies. And uh, you know, perhaps this is a, a good segue to another just enormously terrific panelist that we have, which is uh, Ms. Rachel Kleinfeld. Uh, who is a senior fellow in the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program at the uh, uh, Carnegie um, uh, Endowment for International Peace. 
Uh, she uh, has uh, written extensively on troubled democracies facing problems such as polarized populations, violence and corruption, but also written very extensively on issues of rule of law, uh, security sector reform, um, conflict uh, and policing. Uh, Rachel uh, has uh, consulted for the US government and international organizations such as OECD, the World Bank, the European Union. Uh, she serves on the UN uh, Security Sector Reforms Advisory Board, uh, and uh, she, has, uh, she is also a fellow at the Halifax uh, International Security um, Forum. Prior uh, to Carnegie being very lucky to have Rachel, uh, Rachel spent the decade uh, co-funding and directing the Truman National Security Project uh, that fosters uh, a new generation of national security leaders and military veterans, uh, a work for which the Time magazine uh, recognized Rachel very appropriately at the time as one of the top 40 political leaders under 40. And between 2011 and 2014, she served on the Foreign Affairs uh, Policy Board that advises the US uh, Secretary of State at the time uh, uh, Ms. Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, Rachel is a, a author of many excellent pieces. Uh, Adam already referred to one of her articles that I encourage everyone to read. And she also is the author of, of many books, including two that I want to highlight, A Savage Order uh, and Advancing the Rule of Law Abroad, The Next Generation Reform. If you haven't yet read them, rush to buy them along with Adam's book. Uh, Rachel, um, uh, over to you on your thoughts and reflections on both the lessons broadly, but also this issue. Can we really go local, recognizing that partner governments, in quote unquote partner, are often deeply troubled, deeply misaligned, or not aligned at all, deeply contradictory to the agenda of inclusive, stable, accountable governance? Can we simply go around them? Can we only deal with local actors? What is the balance? Uh, how that one needs to strike in maneuvering the systems of complexities about which uh, Adam so eloquently writes. Thank you so much, Vanda. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, and uh, for, for following Heather and Adam is really a tough act. I do field research. They've lived in the field for many, many years in multiple um, very difficult places. And so um, I would take my remarks with a grain of salt, given that um, I'm also going to be unduly optimistic here. Usually I'm the one who says very negative things about the United Nations. I'm going to start off by actually praising them and then moving into the problems because um, many of my remarks were taken by Adam and Heather. I'm actually Vanda in her introduction right now. So you'll hear some reprises, but I'll bring up, um, I'll bring up some of the good stuff and then I'll caveat and then I'll go into um, some, some of the changes that need to happen. Academic research has been actually really clear on the United Nations peacekeeping being quite effective. And so I just want to bring that up here that peacekeeping, what the academics show is it's good at resolving civil wars. It's good at reducing violence during wars. It's good at preventing wars from recurring. Um, it protects lives. It keeps violence lower. All sorts of good things, sizable and statistically significant effects. Um, conflict zones that have UN peacekeeping missions tend to have fewer deaths than um, places without them. And that's in, in cases that where the UN um, sends peacekeeping missions, those tend to be the hardest places. You tend to get UN peacekeeping missions in the most volatile areas where mistrust is high, where countries are quite poor, um, or frankly, there aren't a lot of bilateral incentives to, to engage. Um, so, so that's all good news. And I wanna name all that because there's a reason the UN keeps doing things that we're all going to critique right now. And one of the reasons is that because they can show a lot of positives um, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of incentive to say, well, these are good things that the violence is down, the war has stopped and so on. Um, and so let's, let's keep on doing what we're doing. And I think a lot of the critique falls on two sides. One is um, you see political critiques on the unintended consequences, the cholera, the distorted local economies that the UN peacekeeping missions the, um, bring, the uh, sexual violence, things like that, that are unintended consequences of throwing often um, a lot of young men and a lot of money into, um, into different areas. Uh, the other side of it though, is that when the UN does these peacekeeping missions, they have a model as uh, the previous commentators have mentioned. And that model tends to reify the government and it tends to reify um, structures of power that are governmentally uh, sanctioned. And so those things can, can do all the good things that I just mentioned in terms of bringing down violence and so on, 
But what they do is solidify a structure that then becomes very hard to change afterward. And that structure causes ongoing problems. And so if you look at what the UN says about its peacekeeping missions, it acknowledges failures like Haiti, and then it names successes like Cote d'Ivoire and Croatia and Liberia and so on, Timor-Leste. And then it talks about Cambodia, usually in a positive way. Um, but the blindness to these political structures and these power structures that can be predatory or brutal and the sort of aspirational aspect of working with NGOs and civil society that are gender neutral or positive to women um, and, and various things that the UN wants leads to a um, reification of the central authority even when it's not congruent with the power structure. And that's particularly the case in countries that Alex DeWall talks about as political marketplaces where uh, power might be very transactional and be changing quite quickly or where it's just very personalistic. And so bureaucratic structures don't work particularly well with those personalistic structures or where the government itself as in uh, Sudan, for instance, um, is sort of a prop of the international uh, structure and the actual powers that move underneath it do not um, fit within the, the lines of authority that have been set out on nice PowerPoints that sort of set out what the government is supposed to look like. In those cases, after bringing down violence or what have you, um, what the UN is doing by pouring money into these systems in a slow way that takes a long time to get chairs, as Heather has mentioned, um, and by working with certain actors and sidelining other actors, is that they build up the power of actors who either do not actually have power and therefore cannot continue without the backing of the United Nations, or they're building up the power of some actors in a world in which there are other actors still fighting for power. And the UN has kind of put a top on that by just being present, but it can't actually uh, create a power structure out of whole cloth. They're international, they rely on a government to, to say that it's okay for them to be there and so on and so forth. And so th they're sort of, um, I think of my pressure cooker, they're sort of holding things down on top of this pressure cooker while all the activity is going on inside and underneath. Now, I don't need to expand too much on the fa fabulous suggestions that Adam and Heather have already made. I think they're absolutely right that the way in which we have to move beyond uh, UN 1.0 into UN 2 or 3.0 has to do with um, actually examining the power structures, working with who actually has power in these states, and then moving toward um, using that power structure to move toward more open structures, whereas the uh, UN tends to um, perhaps inadvertently uh, enable autocratic structures, um, both in economic and in political terms. Um, and so working toward more open structures politically and economically would be um, the next phase that we'd want to move to. But I want to talk, as I started out with, uh, here are the good things the UN is doing and why it's hard for them to necessarily see the problems. There are problems with the UN structure that are making this very hard. One is um, the workforce development issue. There's a lot of actors in the United Nations and a lot of them need to get this understanding. For very few of them is it in their incentive structure to do this uh, well. It's a very hard thing to do as Heather can testify on the ground um, and the structures and incentives for any particular job within the workforce of the UN is to do the things for which metrics are easily developed and that meet those metrics and this stuff doesn't work with that kind of a metric system, especially a metric system developed ahead of time that doesn't change. Adam mentioned my uh, piece on sailboats, not trains. These are extremely dynamic systems. You need to navigate like a sailboat, not like a train. And as a result, um, these pre-developed metrics that the workforce has to meet just, just aren't going to function in these systems. But until that changes, you're not going to get the UN to change because the UN is simply an agglomeration of lots of individuals. The second point I wanted to make was about the geopolitical nature. Vandas talked about um, the new Cold War moving beyond the kind of old um, coin and CT world into this new Cold War world. That certainly is impacting the United Nations, um, given who is on the Security Council, the great power competition that has started up with the UN, with sorry, with the US and China, the US and Russia, many um, allied nations, the US and Russia. And also the often unacknowledged in the US fact that most of the world hasn't joined that democratic um, grouping uh, that's fighting Russia, um, but is actually sitting on the sidelines, has many more mixed views, doesn't necessarily see this as democracy versus autocracy, 
Um, and so you have a large sort of rebirth of the non-aligned movement that uh, plays a very significant role in the United Nations. Without acknowledging those dynamics, we can't really move into UN 2 or 3.0 because um, th those are the power holders within the United Nations ultimately as the Security Council and, um, and all the other nations that make up the, the UN power structure. And they're not necessarily on board with moving toward a more democratic uh, type of peacekeeping. Many of them are backsliding democracies themselves. The whole world is seeing backsliding democracy. Um, and so if you're saying, well, the UN should be moving toward open economic structures and open political competition, and uh, the many, many, many countries have no interest in that whatsoever internally, you're gonna see it hard to push that within the UN structure. And then the final issue is the issue that Adam and Heather have already touched on, so, so I won't emphasize it, but I just wanna double down that in country, there's a reason that these long-term power structure issues get reified um, and that the hard issues get punted or get moved to the side. And it's because UN um, personnel are functioning in a world in which they have to have government sanction. And as long as they have to have government sanction, um, doing things that sideline the very government they're working under because it doesn't actually have power or that sideline parts of that government in order to open up these power structures is a very difficult enterprise. Um, I'm not quite sure how you do that. Um, I gave my first book talk on a savage order at DPKO and when I got to the end of the book talk and I had to uh, talk about what they should do, I realized I had no recommendations whatsoever because when you started from the point of view of you have to work with the government and the government is the problem um, and you have to open up the government, I just hadn't thought through what you do about that. And frankly, four years later, five years later, I still haven't come up with a lot of great ideas for what you do and, and it's a fundamental uh, challenge in the system. So I'll stop there. Oh, um, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Rachel, rather. Um, you have, um, you know, one of the uh, many fascinating uh, points you made uh, is something that I want to ask um, Richard, which is about the new geopolitics. What does this mean for functionality of authorizing UN missions and for um, making them uh, effective, perhaps more effective, but at least effective um, on the ground. In picking uh, people for a panel and thinking how to conceptualize a panel, when I know that I have three uh, enormous stars, it's always an issue to come up with a uh, closer who will be star uh, in that same high caliber and quality. And I'm so terrifically grateful that uh, Rachel Gowan has been able to join us and that he is now going to bring us uh, to uh, the end of the first round, and then we will uh, much more briefly go into policy recommendations. Richard Gowan oversees uh, the International Crisis Group's advocacy work at the United Nations, uh, where he uh, engages diplomats and UN officials uh, in New York, and he is without doubt uh, one of the leading voices on all matters uh, UN. Uh, Richard has uh, also worked at the European Council on Foreign Relations, the New York University Center on International Cooperation, and the uh, Foreign Policy Center in London. He has taught at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia uh, and at Stanford. Uh, he also uh, has been a consultant for many of the organizations that uh, we are speaking about, uh, including the UN Department of Political Affairs, uh, the UN uh, Office uh, of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on International Migration, um, as well as uh, a plethora of other um, uh, actors involved with uh, international state building efforts, such as the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, and uh, the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Global Affairs uh, Canada. Richard, new geopolitics, what does that mean for us? Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Wanda, and um, it's it's an honour to be the equivalent of the the reserve pitcher who is brought in in the last innings of the baseball game to try and close things out. Um, it's difficult for me to follow such a distinguished panel, but I'll share a few thoughts. Um, the the first thought was actually listening to all the presentations reminded me of one of my favourite poems. Uh, which is On Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. And that's a poem about the loss of Christian faith in the 19th century. And Arnold talks about the long, melancholy withdrawing roar of the Christian faith. 
And I think what we're hearing today is the melancholy, long withdrawing roar of faith in state building. Because as you said at the outset, um, you know, this belief in state building, this sort of aspiration for state building really dates back to the first decade of this century. And to be quite honest, we've seen diplomats and UN officials gradually losing faith in this construct for pretty much a decade. It's worth keeping in mind that the Security Council last uh, mandated new large scale blue helmet missions in 2013 and 2014. Those were the missions to Mali and the Central African Republic. And while the Security Council has continued to renew the mandates for peace operations in places like South Sudan, it hasn't uh, sent any new operations of that type to other countries suffering from civil wars or major insurgencies. And that suggests that members of the Security Council are increasingly mistrustful of what UN state building can achieve. Instead of these large scale missions, we've seen the Security Council returning to experimenting with quite small, lightweight observer missions. Uh, there is, for example, a lightweight observer mission in Hodeida in Yemen, um, overseeing a humanitarian agreement there. And in addition, the UN as a whole is shifting back to a focus on what humanitarian agencies can do. And whereas 10 to 15 years ago, it was the Department of Peacekeeping Operations that really set the agenda around conflict management in the UN, we now see the humanitarians and organizations like the World Food Programme increasingly setting the agenda for what the UN can do. And this is actually especially relevant and interesting in one case that we referred to at the beginning, which is Afghanistan. Because in Afghanistan, we're now in a situation where effectively we've given up on the 20 years of, of peace building that began in 2001 with the Taliban takeover of Kabul. But the UN humanitarians are still there. And actually it's the World Food Programme and UNICEF and organizations like that, which are basically keeping Afghanistan alive. And what we've got in Afghanistan is the UN sustaining a state run by the Taliban that has overthrown all the state building work we tried to do. Um, largely for humanitarian reasons and also because no one wants to see a massive outflow of refugees from Afghanistan. So I think the era of state building is being replaced by a much more ad hoc era of lightweight peacemaking and humanitarian engagement. And then, yes, the geopolitics is kicking in. One of the reasons the Security Council isn't innovating so much in terms of peacekeeping is precisely that there are growing tensions between the permanent members, and obviously those have accelerated this year. China and Russia do push back on some of the ambitious liberal concepts of state building that the US and allies uh, would like to propose through the Security Council. And outside the UN, we're also seeing these powers uh, getting involved in proxy wars and deploying um, either their own personnel or deploying private military companies, uh, often into many of the, the places where the UN already has a presence. So the Wagner Group, which you referred to is present in Libya, is present in Mali, and it's present in the Central African Republic. And certainly what we're seeing in Mali at the moment right now is that the Malian government, relying more and more on Russian mercenary support, is becoming increasingly aggressive and negative towards the UN presence. So um, a lot of these geopolitical tensions are playing out in a uh, very pointed way and very direct way in places where the UN is deployed. I also think it's worth touching on one other, perhaps more positive development of the international crisis management scene, which is that uh, we're seeing a shift in interest from UN large scale operations to operations run by the African Union and other regional organizations. There's a big focus in the UN on what can be done to support regional peace operations. And it may be that the future of stabilization and state building uh, lies not with uh, blue helmet operations, but with green helmet operations of the type that is already deployed in Somalia and is being discussed now in the context of the Sahel um, as an alternative to the, the UN operation in Mali. So what's the big picture? The big picture is a mess. And the mess is likely to get messier um, in a period of increasingly fragmented geopolitics. But I think that the, the sort of 
2001 to 2011 period of aspirational state building is probably now um, a historical artifact. And a lot of what we're looking at is really the leftovers of an, er an earlier and perhaps more hopeful era. Well, in many ways, Richard, those are not surprising comments, but they are still very sobering. Um, and you know, even though I, in my opening remark, uh, made some similar points, I want to emphasize to all of us, not just all of us on the panel today, but uh, our audience, that the, um, uh, th despite your very poetic uh, description of the loss of faith in state building, we should be mindful that the aspirations and objectives of state building remain enormously valid. They are about uh, people having greater accountability uh, of, uh, uh, of their governments or, or non-state arm actors who rule them. Uh, they are about people having greater inclusion in the politics and economies uh, of the countries where they have to live in, about having decent and improving life, about being subject to less violence, to less severe human rights abuses. And so even as the international appetite has significantly diminished for, for state building as we have been um, doing it over the past 20 years and the geopolitics makes it very difficult uh, to continue doing it, the aspirations remain valid. We are also at a time where countries like the United States have lost appetites for great military uh, interventions against uh, terrorist actors. So on the one hand, we are pulling back from uh, milita large military deployments, but we are also pulling back from um, state building. What does this leave us with? It leaves us with occasional hits against particular bad non state armed actors. I would posit this is not a good overall conceptualization of the issue. And I would suggest that we look at some of the lessons from anti-crime efforts, which uh, for many years and at various times and periodically become shrunk to the occasional hit against a narco, the occasional hit against a mafia boss, and ignore uh, the need to um, enable um, uh, communities to support the anti-crime efforts. And that requires making lives of the communities economically, politically, with respect to human rights, viable with legality. So um, this perhaps is uh, a, a transition now to um, hearing from all um, four of you, your key thoughts of uh, given the challenges, given the new geopolitics, given the, the, the lessons that you all outlined uh, in such very eloquent way, what are some of the key actions point? What are some of the policy recommendations uh, uh, in about um, four minutes, uh, please, so we can go to uh, also questions from audience uh, in how to do um, state building better, or if we are no more doing state building at all, what do we do instead? Adam, let me start with you and go in the same order, please. Great, thanks, Vanda. I'll try and do six in four minutes, six policy thoughts, a couple of sentences each. The first one comes from one of my favorite words doing this research, which is thixotropia, which has to do with substances that get less viscous when they're shaken up and then harden when they calm down. And I think we, we tend to assume that these moments of immediate post-conflict are the right time to try and set new things in place and to create a new uh, elite bargain or a new national power sharing arrangement. And some of my research indicated that these moments of immediate post-conflict flux are often the moments when the, the strong attractors and the, the, the rules governing those systems actually exert themselves most strongly. And so there may be some thought to be given about the timing of interventions rather than trying to change course in a, in a storm or right after it, when societies may feel those strong attractors, maybe focus on uh, addressing those, those issues um, in a different moment. And I actually think Rachel's book, Savage Order, talks about the kind of downward trajectory of middle-income countries not in conflict and offers a lot of really interesting ways to transform those ones. So just buy Rachel's book, and that has all of the policy implications I want. The second one is, is this point I kind of hinted at, which is to reimagine the local. And it's kind of the converse of Rachel's point about reifying the government and uh, the state. We also tend to reify the local and romanticize it and think it has all the answers. It's this kind of idyllic village where conflict can be understood, which I think is actually a very colonial attitude. And much of what I hear is kind of reminiscent of the British mandate period when I hear about kind of the local 
turn and things like that. Systems don't have a local in that sense. The local is a, a node, a meeting of relationships in, in a point where different actors come together. And so for me, a very, con a very concrete change we could make is within the UN to get rid of civil affairs and political affairs as a distinction. Civil affairs deals with local, political affairs deals with national. Get rid of that and work to map networks and their interconnectedness, what Rachel calls mapping political structures, I think would be a much more interesting starting point for, for this. The third is also to revisit uh, resilience. Um, we tend to think of it as a normatively positive word. UNDP kind of organizes its work around resilience. My research shows that systems of governance like those in the DRC and South Sudan are extraordinarily resilient and they're capable of dealing with massive shocks, including the shock of state building without changing their underlying rules. And we may need to think more about how to work with the grain of those systems rather than to transform them right away and to gradually shift underlying rules and patterns rather than to try and push them towards some sort of Western understanding of peaceful resilience, which tends to be behind things. The fourth is agency. We tend to blame um, a lot of the fault on a lack of political will. We talk about here in Machar kind of failing South Sudan and, and Kabila being the, at fault in, in, in Congo. And yes, those are culpable actors, um, but the systems around them constrain them and shape their decisions more than we tend to know. And I think by mapping the system, you can see how Kier's attempt to appoint a multi-ethnic cabinet in South Sudan um, actually was, an, a, a, I think, a fairly good faith effort to change things. And the system really worked hard against it, similarly with many of Kabila's reforms. So I think to reframe the issue of political will and think more about what complex systems people would call the phase space for change, for system change. So what's the range of potential change in this system in this given time period would be a better starting point than to think about political will. Almost finally, um, I do think that this idea of having what uh, John Paul later I calls a moral imagination and a willingness to let people tell their own stories about their societies and not to try and fit them into a log frame would be very useful having that humility to have the long, slow change. Um, again, Rachel's metaphor of tacking against the wind. I think if you try and impose a results-based budget of success and failure over the year, you'll never have the space to hear what people say about their own system and their own society. And I certainly think that Frank Fukuyama's end of history is wrong. There are many manifestations of governance that don't meet the Western liberal model and staying open to that, being listening to that um, is, is another important um, Point that tends to get obscured by results-based budgets. Um, and then I think uh, Rachel did a great list of activities that can have an impact. And I've found in my own research significant impact in unanticipated areas like quiet work on rule of law in South Sudan, support to mobile courts in Eastern DRC, surprisingly strong impact of political advice by mediators like Haile Mankarios and others. And I think focusing really on what works, getting out of that, Rachel's correct uh, critique of the metrics approach to impact, but think about what change really looks like and investing in that rather than continuing on on investing in these cooker cutter models of peacekeeping with the same mandates and the same capacities. Maybe we need to invest in more chairs for Yemen, uh, a la a, a Heather's point, or roads. Everybody I talked to in South Sudan, um, when I asked what they wanted, mentioned roads. Um, that might be another way to respond to needs rather than send, spending another 900 million on, on, on troops. Um, again, those structures and incentives within the UN system are very hard to change, as, as Rachel's point out. And I think this may actually lead to what Richard's talking about, which is a contraction um, to smaller, potentially more humanitarian focus missions centered around the, the clear value added of the UN. It might mean more outsourcing to green helmets, maybe even a new generation of peacekeeping that's driven by a different set of goals. That's what the new agenda for peace in the common agenda report is, is meant to open the door to. Maybe some of Vanda's ideas about being more kind of following an anti-crime model. But I do want to finish with one thought, which is that I think there is still going to be a need within the international system to offload those intractable conflicts on something. And that something is probably going to be the UN. And so we are probably going to need to grapple with another couple big-ish missions um, in, in the medium term. Um, and so I don't think we can count on that contraction happening too quickly. Thanks, Vanda. Heather, hey Heather, over to you. Uh, one other addition I would make here, which is, uh, let me reiterate again how uh, superior the UN has been often in really uh, understanding local systems. So, you know, A. Heather is very eloquent that we need more political mapping, but let's also do comparison with how countries like 
uh, the United States or um, uh, actors like NATO have done it. And the level of UN presence, really UN pulse on the ground, UN understanding of the mission, uh, of, of the situation has in many of these missions often been vastly ahead uh, of uh, even actors with very superior uh, signal intelligence. Hey, Heather, over to you, please. Well, Vonda, that may say something about the level that the other the other international interventions work at rather than the, the high quality that we're bringing to it. But but I'll take the compliment <laughs> as intended. Um, it, it, I, I wanted to start by uh, echoing Adam's uh, call for humility. Uh, it's funny that you both mentioned the anti-crime efforts because I think my first recommendation is always to make everybody who goes into these interventions first watch The Wire, the miniseries about counter-drug in, in Baltimore. And if anything captures complexity, it is that show. And if you can't fix the drug problem in Baltimore, where you know the language, you know the culture, you know the history, you know the players, it's your own country. How are you going to do that in Afghanistan or Somalia? Or, or Yemen or anywhere else. So I make all my young soldiers and my civil, uh, my, uh, civil affairs folks uh, watch that before they come out. Um, the second it, it, lesson I would take away, a recommendation I'd make is to focus on a process rather than preferred outcomes. So there are a couple of things that we have some value added as the UN um, to do. One is enabling access for actors who are outside that traditional scope of state building to access the halls of power, to, to push for their own priorities. By virtue of the UN's relationship with national security leaders, we can actually insist that civil society or local mediators get a chance to be at the decision-making table. And the other thing that we can do is support alliances between like-minded organizations so that they can be stronger in their own lobbying for their interests. And, and that's where, at the risk of being a colonialist, that's where we can make connections with people who do have outcomes that we as the UN value and support, because we can encourage those kinds of, um, of organizations who share our values to, to uh, ally with each other and, and be stronger at what they do. Um, then the third point I'd like to make is just that there are new guidelines on SSR that the UN has just issued that really do try to internalize some of these lessons. But as Rachel explained, there are some really hard obstacles for inculcating them into the field missions. Um, and I think I think that's still going to be an uphill battle. Um, it it's sometimes feels like being a little bit of a loose cannon when you are advocating for some of these things. So I really appreciate all the, the moral support and therapy that I've gotten from this session. Over for me. Rachel, please. Sure. Well, um, first, I want to just set the stage a little bit because um, we've lived through a bit of a, a hiatus from history for the last couple of decades, and history has come back with a roar. Um, and I think it's worth just setting the stage for the UN with, within that democracy is declining quite significantly. And we've got different isms fighting again, not just uh, China's more autocratic development model versus the United States, but people underestimate, I think, Russia's um, model to the world, this sort of traditional hierarchical white male Christian model um, is very attractive within a lot of countries. Um, and so we've got isms fighting, we have democracies declining. That uh, suggests to me that we're looking at a world with much greater conflict, much more local conflict than we've seen over the last couple of decades, many more regional players involved in that local conflict than we've been seeing. And we've been seeing it growing, obviously, for the few, last few years and more international war, which has almost been an advance um, and has certainly come back. This is what's going to be the next generation of conflict. And as Vanda was saying, the UN does it better than the US, it does it better than France. Um, and th that's you know maybe not saying much, but it really does put the, um, the onus on us to help the UN get it still better because it's going to get worse. Um, and, and this is the best we've got. Um, Heather mentioned The Wire. I also am um, a big aficionado. I actually read it, watched it after writing my book, and I felt a little bit of despair. I thought, you know, people should just uh, not read my book, watch The Wire, and kind of squint, and then they'll get to whatever country they're, they're working in. Um, so I think that has most of the lessons, and I'm just going to embellish on uh, that screenplay. Um, but I have five quick points. One is I want to go back to how do we get the UN to change? You know, there's the old joke how many psychiatrists to take to, does it take to change a light bulb? 
one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Um, that is the situation of the UN. It has to want to change to do these kind of big changes we're suggesting. It does not currently want to change, um, but there are some reasons it might. The US is still not paying its full arrears. Those arrears got really large under Trump. Uh, China is walking toward paying more. That's an interesting dynamic. So, so there's things that might encourage the staff to want to change. And I think we need to um, harness those to make the changes we're suggesting. Um, in terms of things it can do outwardly, Heather mentioned the new Secretary General's report on UNSSR. It's a really good report. I really um, like it, so I don't want to be overly critical. Um, but there's an assumption in that report that if the UN addresses the hard stuff up front, then later implementation will go better. That one of the problems that the UN's having is that it's punting the hard stuff. Um, and then uh, in that moment of flux that Adam was talking about, you can get more done. I agree that you can get more done in that moment of flux, but I'd suggest that one of the reasons the hard things aren't addressed up front is because they're the hard things. Those are the most crucial elements around which security um, apparatuses, militias, and so on are jockeying and often inc increasing the violence to have a bigger stance at the negotiating table and the UN's incentives to keep down the violence and so to, to get an agreement and, and punt on these hard things. So my, the thinking I've been doing recently is that the question for the international community is not just um, how do we get a peace or even how do we prevent those who gained from war from profiting from peace, but this kind of work with the grain that Adam's talking about. It's really how do we transform a moment of peace that necessarily is going to entail providing undue power to people who profited from violence, undue power to corrupt individuals um, and groups and transnational networks. Just accept that that is what the peace deal is going to entail. And there's only so much we can do about it. We should do whatever we can, but there's only so much. We're going to be starting from there. Then how do we transform that into a long-term political and economic settlement that's more just, more democratic, more open, and more lasting? We've given a lot of intellectual effort to that first step. How do we get a more just and lasting peace? And very little to what do we do with our imperfect peace and how do we transform it into a more fair and open political settlement um, that's realistic about what we're starting with. And I think if we treat this as a two-step process, we might be able to um, come up with some more creative ideas that are more realistic for how we get to that second step. I've been thinking a lot in terms of tripwires, provisions that, for instance, might strip violent actors of political or economic power or security sector power, but they aren't retroactive. They kick in only after missteps down the line um, so that you can maybe get them into the initial peace agreement. Um, nobody thinks they'll actually be applied. Um, that might provide part of the answer. Another idea is um, creating more institutions of justice that are outside the reach of the politicians that also kick in. So tripwires that have um, investigative institutions that are funded internationally that are kind of semi-governmental and semi-independent. Um, Ghana had, had structures like this to investigate corruption, for instance, they recently denuded them of all their power, but it worked for a while. Um, but anyhow, investigative institutions, adjudicative institutions that would um, allow uh, uh, more transparency into the system. Donors could insist on accounting procedures, um, audit bodies, things like that, that would enable power to be taken away after the fact. Um, and even institutions of justice like CSIG style um, activities that would be built into the initial peace agreement, but would take an effect later and would sort of grow in power. And then the last thing I'll say is that one thing the UN could do right away and bilateral donors too, is be much more transparent about its security and aid assistance. Often one of the issues with this assistance is not just that it distorts local economies, which can be a little inevitable with that much money and personnel flowing into a poor and small country, but that no one knows where the money is going and that builds distrust um, it builds distrust for internationals, it builds distrust within the system. And I think if there was much more transparency, if people knew where it was going and if they knew where to place the blame, if they're upset with the UN versus upset with um, people in their own country who are stealing the money, um, transparency could go a, a long way toward, um, toward helping with that. So I'll stop there. Richard, please. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you. I mean, so I am unique in that I have not watched The Wire. Um, but I, I did go to school with the actor who plays McNulty. So really, you should have asked Dominic West to um, come and uh, uh, speak in this slot. But he may have been too expensive. Um, I would make three points. I mean, the first relates to 
my argument about the the new focus on the UN's humanitarian role. And I would simply say we shouldn't underrate that. And even if you look at a situation such as Ukraine, and the, the UN has no political role in Ukraine at the moment, but it has played a humanitarian role there, including in trying to cut this very fragile deal we saw at the end of the last week over getting grain out of Odessa. There are places where the, the UN's um, optimum role may be to mitigate conflict and contain conflict, and we shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's also worth saying that the bits of the UN that do that work are often chronically underfunded. I'm sure Heather can tell us how chronically underfunded uh, aid work is in Yemen, but if you look at the, the funding flow for a lot of humanitarian operations, it remains well below what is required. And sometimes I think we should simply throw a bit more money um, in, into those efforts um, as you know, they do play a useful role. Secondly, if we are seeing a turn towards more regionally, regionally led uh, peace operations like African Union led peace operations, there's a lot more we can do to strengthen those. Uh, there is, for example, a long standing proposal for the UN to provide uh, more systematic funding, what's called assessed contributions to African Union peace operations. And I think that's something which the US could push on in the Security Council with support uh, from African states, but also actually countries like China uh, to try and create a stronger basis for the AU in missions going forward, perhaps in places like the Sahel. And thirdly, I think it's absolutely crucial to emphasize what Rachel and others have said, which is that the UN does retain a lot of unique expertise in a lot of aspects of peace operations. And that ranges from mediation to rule of law, but also the technical stuff. The UN is much better at budgeting and administering peace operations than most regional alternatives such as the African Union. And even if we're going to transfer a lot of operational responsibility to these other organizations, we should make sure that the UN is sort of there as a hub of expertise, providing servicing support and background support to these other actors, because we shouldn't waste the expertise that has been built up in New York and in UN field missions over the years. So those are three fairly pragmatic, low-key bits of advice. The other thing I would say is keep an eye on Haiti, because everything is looking very bad in Haiti now. And traditionally, for the last 30 years almost, uh, whenever things go really bad in Haiti, the Security Council sends in the blue helmets. Um, now, right now, there's no appetite in the Security Council to send in a large peacekeeping force. But Adam may be right. We may see a new generation of Blue Helmet missions, and it may well be that one of the first places that uh, sees that happen is actually Haiti. We may go right back to one of the places it all sort of kicked off in the 1990s. I would also add here that even as the West uh, is losing appetite for state building, certainly in the way that it has been conducted, and perhaps for UN state building missions as part of the loss of appetite for state building, China and Russia are moving into the conflict space. Russia, with uh, actors like Wagner Group, simply promising that they will be more brutal than anyone else and will support uh, uh, whoever is in power, will act as the Praetorian Guard uh, for governments in power. And uh, China, both in its support for partner governments, uh, as well as promises that its economic engagement will strengthen those quote unquote partner governments. But also we have just seen um, uh, China's first ever international uh, outside of Asia uh, mediation conference in the Horn of Africa. So we might not have appetite, but others are moving in. Uh, we have um, 15 minutes uh, at this point to uh, take some questions from the audience. We received very many questions and they are excellent questions. A lot of the uh, issues that um, uh, our audience has been asking has actually been uh, already covered uh, in the remarks, which was one of the reasons why I was not pushing the re uh, remarks to greater privacy, because they were engaging with issues of high interest um, to the audience. So perhaps let me put two questions on the table uh, and uh, whoever would like to engage them, uh, please let me know if we have time for another round. I will uh, uh, come to uh, two more questions. Uh, so one of the questions um, uh, asks about how does the UN learn and adapt? To what extent are measures and metrics that are always part of UN uh, missions incorporated in any kind of different action in another mission. Uh, 
um, anyone who would like to engage in that and can that be done better? Um, there are reasons uh, of why systems of disorder systems of uh, uh, certain behavior systems of problems exist, they might perhaps also exist um, in the UN. And the second question I would like to put right now is a fundamental issue for all UN uh, 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 state building missions, but has been also for all US state building missions. How do we get out? How do we get out when the governments don't want us to get out? When they are very comfortable with the international, whether UN or the US or NATO, suppressing conflict to just the level that allows their parochial interests to persist and are very happy that they do not have to take on the key elements of what it's uh, what has been conceptualized as being a government such as uh, preventing violence by other actors. Uh, so uh, Adam, please. Those are great questions. I'll, I'll try and take a stab at both of them, but I know others have different perspectives. The first one on, on how the UN grows and adapts is, is one that we uh, kind of, we're a think tank that tries to help the UN grow and adapt. So it's what we're trying to do all the time. Um, and it's really difficult. And, and I think in the peacekeeping context, there are a few ways. One is it's, it's often easy to underestimate how few people are actually involved in setting mandates for peacekeeping missions. And it's often the same group of P3, P5 members who sit around writing the mandates of these different missions over years, and they gradually kind of uh, learn across them. And often it's it's a process of, um, you know, a, a mission in Mali has a... Uh, uh, an initiative that tries to track the role of criminal networks in, in driving armed groups. And then the people that wrote that mandate realize they can do the same mandate in Congo. And so there's a bit of learning at that level. I think the more interesting learning is through practice and to have people who move from mission to mission and who bring that experience from mission to mission. And so you get someone, I mean, I worked for David Gressley, who had spent uh, years in Mali, years in South Sudan, and then came to Congo. And a lot of the discussions we had was how can you take those experiences about what works and doesn't work in those situations and, and bring them. And so it's very, for me, the, the many of the changes that you see are through the individual experiences of people that have, have moved around. What I don't think tends to happen, and, I, and, and there are entire departments in the UN that try to make this happen, is a kind of systemic um, conscious change to to change a policy that that happens occasionally but it's very difficult to actually to effectuate change in that so I, I think that is uh, a, a difficult one that we try to engage with um, and then there are shocks that can change you know m23 invades goma in 2012 suddenly you have a new doctrine on offensive use of force. Sometimes the outside world just triggers the shock and I think we may be in a moment of, of shock and the question that I think, we're all grappling with is what does that shock result in on the peacekeeping front? On on the um, the how do you get out? I mean, uh, Kofi Annan wrote about this. No no exit without strategy. I believe is a piece. I mean, and it's a recurrent question of what are the conditions under which you can get out of a country. I think what what my research was started with is if you continue to have the same goals you have articulated in terms of security sector reform and national transformation, you'll never get out. And we'll never leave Congo if we have to implement the entire mandate there. We'll never leave Mali. So I think one of the things we did actually worked on the exit strategy for MONUSCO in, in Congo is the, the first question is, what are the minimum conditions under which you can transition to something else? So you start maybe with, and in Congo, we started with security conditions. What are the minimum security conditions under which we could uh, shrink the static footprint of MONUSCO and start transitioning tasks to others? Even that gets really complicated. Um, but I think one of the things I keep coming back to is there is a tendency within the UN to assume that the UN is doing something that it's not doing. So, and you say, you know, we're going to turn the security, often the phrase is we're going to turn security back over to the Congolese. My point is there was never a moment where the UN was in charge of security in Eastern Congo. They, they, they just legally, it was never the case. Factually, it was never the case. So I think the starting point is actually asking the question, what is the UN actually delivering now that is irreplaceable by someone else? And then how do you gradually transition that set of capacity? One of the most interesting ones I can think of right now is Darfur, where um, the UN's role in providing protection to evening patrols, uh, doing evening patrols to protect uh, women doing firewood uh, gathering dramatically reduced the number of um, violent sexual assaults against women. That is something that's very difficult to turn over to another actor right away. 
So then you get into the question of how do you continue to have that impact of reduction or maintaining that low level of sexual assault on women without the UN there? And I think those are very interesting questions when you get into transition moments. And, and Haiti is a great example. They've reconfigured Haiti, Richard, I don't know, 10 times, different acronym, different sets of skills, different like peacekeepers flowing in and out, a rule of law focus, and then not a rule of law focus. I think that that question keeps coming back, which we tend to gloss over the key starting point, which is what is the unique value added of the UN in a given situation? I think that's the interesting question uh, to get to. And often it's it's more than you think it is, but it's almost always different than what the mandate says it is. I'll leave it. Uh, Heather, please. And I'm noticing that we are at uh, 11.21 on my watch. So uh, this will be the only round if you want to add a sentence uh, uh, in any kind of closing remarks, uh, uh, please do so. Uh, uh, a Heather, please. So let me start with the how do we get out? And I'll put a twist on that and say, maybe it's about more about how we get in. There's a phrase that says, start as you mean to go on. And maybe we should only be doing things from the start that we're okay doing indefinitely. And we don't take on a lot of the pieces that make it impossible for us to ever get out because the actors uh, get dependent on that. And, and things would break very badly if we withdrew, as we've seen. So, so that sort of gets back to some of the, the recommendations I made on doing process over outcomes and, and catalyzing relationships uh, that, that are more uh, productive between local actors as opposed to us taking on some of those responsibilities. On the learn and adapt, maybe I'm still waiting to see the learning and adapting, but um, I think in contrast to the small number of movers and shapers that uh, Adam talked about in peacekeeping, the special political missions where I've mostly spent my career are a lot more actors floating around in different places. There's not so much centralized guidance and, and help for us to do those things we do. I think though he does, I do agree with Adam that if people find what works, they find things and then they take it with them when they move to another place. Not that the context is gonna mean it's it, it's the same solution because everything depends on, on the unique um, uh, characteristics of that environment. But there's certainly things that tend to be groups of things that, that people should consider looking at. And what I would love to see is something that incentivizes using them. So structures that support, that have funding or, or uh, expertise to support the kinds of things that we've seen work in other contexts that can maybe fit or be considered um, for the new place, such as you know the emphasis on civil defense and accountability programming to start rather than the big trade and equip uh, missions. Thank you. Richard, would you like to, uh, well, I, I can say a word or two. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna speak to the learning and adapting because the other three panelists know much more than me, but in terms of getting in and getting out, I think there's two ways to look at this. One is, um, as Heather was saying, only go in doing the things that will enable you to get out. Don't take on core functions um, that, uh, that you can't get out of. Another way of looking at this is take on things that you're willing to do for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and accept that the UN is gonna be there, that it's a very low cost, um, tends to be light footprint compared to most other options, that you're always looking at what's the other option. Um, and that in some cases, having the UN there to protect uh, the women gathering firewood or uh, water might be the best of all available options. In other cases, that might be something to build into local abilities through some kind of um, uh, governmental or non-governmental functionality but there's something else the UN is gonna be doing indefinitely. And, and I, I'm not perfectly comfortable with that suggestion. Certainly my, myself of the 1990s would have been extremely uncomfortable with that suggestion, but myself of the 2020s um, thinks that uh, we might need long-term footprints in some of these places, that there might not be another viable alternative. Um, and that um, thinking about what that footprint uh, looks like, how it functions within that society, and just accepting that the world of nation states that had full sovereignty over their um, countries and borders with no international uh, uh, encroachment has been a very short period of international history that for much, much longer, there were colonies, there were states made up of religious groups that covered large empires. There were all sorts of different arrangements. Right now we're in a world of nation states that doesn't seem to be working all that well. 
um, in which we pretend they're nation states, but in fact, there are colonial arrangements of one sort or another. There are still large empires, and we kind of pretend that's not the case. But um, when you look particularly at these conflicts in which regional powers are playing large roles and so on, we just have to sort of admit what actually is. And if what actually is, is a much messier world with, with much less clear sovereignty, maybe the UN has a role to play in that that it needs to just acknowledge. And certainly in places like Somalia, the role that uh, international actors envision for the African Union mission, now ATMIS, uh, is not just protecting women going to fiber, perhaps not at all protecting women going to water holes uh, and uh, co uh, collecting firewood, but stopping Al-Shabaab from taking over the country explicitly. Uh, Richard, uh, your um, thoughts on the recommendations. I mean, look, firstly, I think that the UN has many imperfections uh, when it comes to learning and change, but it's also still a remarkably open institution, um, primarily because there's no real confidentiality in the UN, so nothing is really secret, which makes it easier to share um, ideas. And also, everyone expects the UN to fail. I mean, I remember a Norwegian diplomat saying to me 15 years ago, the great thing about the UN is that it always fails, so you can be honest about the fact that it's failing. Whereas um, a lot of other institutions and governments don't really like to admit failure. So overall, I think the UN is open and the fact that the UN listens to people like Adam and Rachel is, is very much part of that. So that's a positive note to, to end on. Um, on getting out, let's just keep in mind that we've got out of quite a few places okay. Um, the UN is largely out of Kosovo, it's out of Timor, it's out of Liberia, it's out of Cote d'Ivoire. There are a lot of places where we did state building, and guess what? There are states there. Um, and so actually, in a lot of cases, this has worked. The real challenge is getting out of the, the Darfurs or the Eastern Congos, where there is really no obvious endpoint on the horizon. And there I would agree somewhat with Rachel that even in places like Mali, um, crisis group would argue that however constrained MINUSMA is now, it's better to have the UN than not. So um, we shouldn't hurry. Uh, we shouldn't sort of always hurry for exit strategies. Sometimes um, the UN is, is better than nothing at all. Well, I mentioned um, earlier that um, a challenge for designing a panel uh, is always thinking how the stars will line up and how the excitement will carry across the conversation. And the challenge can be particularly when one talks about issues such as UN reform, which could be a rather uh, esoteric and stale uh, conversation. This has certainly not been uh, the case with ours. Uh, I am enormously grateful to our speakers and uh, the tremendous amount of insight, punchy lines, poetry, and real deep thinking and knowledge from the field uh, that they brought to the conversation of how uh, UN state mission, state building missions have uh, have fared, and how they uh, are evolving. What kind of constraints, opportunities they face, and um, the way forward. Um, we heard uh, analysis uh, of the systems of disorders that are self-perpetuating and resilient uh, that Adam so powerfully writes about in his new book, States of Disorder. Uh, we heard about how change is nonlinear, uh, as uh, Rachel has written about uh, in her work. We heard from A. Heather, um, as well as many others, about the overfocus on governments and power elites that are uh, not aligned with the agenda of stabilizing, um, uh, of getting away out of conflict, stabilizing the situations, and making governance more accountable and more inclusive but also about the challenges from Rachel about simply going local, uh, something that Adam also spoke about, or simply relying on civil society actors. So these um, agents of change are very important, but they can be co-opted into the system and or they can be neutralized by the systems. So uh, the limits of simply saying you'll only do with civil society or with not same arm actors does not seem like a viable solution. We also heard from uh, Richard about the new geopolitics and the opportunities, perhaps the shrinking of missions to more humanitarian oriented missions, and uh, nonetheless their enormous um, usefulness, but also uh, highlighting to us that we might be on the cusp of a new deployment, such as uh, to a place like uh, Haiti. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to uh, add uh, one uh, thought of my recommendation, and that is that in this new era, um, we should perhaps be focusing not on uh, the way things have been done, but on shaping non-STEM arm actors and shaping our present partners. And then instead of uh, engaging uh, in broad um, uh, transformational efforts, uh, we will really need to focus on um, incremental change, looking for moments of opportunities, uh, uh, dealing with actors that might be partners and allies one moment, but understanding that they might stop being valid partners and allies in another moment, being able to uh, share them and perhaps realizing that uh, the uh, objectives that we have toward more peaceful society, toward more accountable society, toward more inclusive society, might stall, sometimes might go back and we might locate another moment of opportunities in this shaping environment where we shape both our enemies as well as our present partners. Thank you very much all uh, for your terrific remarks. Uh, thank uh, you, uh, our audience, for sending really terrific questions, for joining us today. Uh, look forward to uh, more uh, events from uh, the Initiative of Non-STEM Arm Actors and the Africa Security Initiative, including uh, our conversation on Friday at Brookings uh, that we will have with the outgoing Colombian uh, ambassador uh, about uh, Colombia and its uh, uh, state building efforts. I will be uh, joining him on the panel and my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Hanlon, will be the moderator.